God bless the great state of Texas. It is really good to be home. You know, I'm thrilled to be back at Prestonwood with so many dear friends. Thank you for, for coming out today. Thank you for welcoming us all here. Thank you for this tremendous gathering. You know, this morning at the pulpit, Dr. Graham may have gone back to the original Greek, looking at Scripture. If you look to the etymology of the word politics, there are two parts. Poly, meaning many, and ticks, meaning blood-sucking parasites. <laughs> and that is a fairly accurate description of Washington, D.C. But, you know, I'll tell you, we all came out here this afternoon because I think we recognize that our country's in crisis. I don't believe this is a typical time in politics, a typical time in our country. We are bankrupting our kids and grandkids. Our constitutional rights are under assault each and every day. And Texans know it. <laughs> And America has receded from leadership in the world. And it's making the world a much more dangerous place. And yet I'm here this afternoon with a hope, word of hope and encouragement and exhortation. Let me tell you, people are waking up. We are seeing an awakening. We are seeing a spirit of revival across this nation. There are many things as Texans we could talk about today. We could talk about bringing back jobs and growth and opportunity. We could talk about abolishing the IRS. We could talk about repealing Obamacare. We could talk about standing unshakably with our friend and ally, the nation of Israel. I want to talk to something close to home. I want to talk about the threats to religious liberty we're seeing in this country. Religious liberty is under threat today like it never has been before in this nation. You know, I've been blessed to spend much of my adult life fighting to defend religious liberty. When I was the Solicitor General of Texas, Greg Abbott and I together, we defended the Ten Commandments monument on the state capitol grounds. We went to the U.S. Supreme Court and we won 5-4. We defended the Pledge of Allegiance, the words, One Nation Under God, when an atheist filed a lawsuit seeking to strike down the pledge. We went to the U.S. Supreme Court and we won unanimously. And I joined with our friend Kelly Shackelford in representing over three million veterans pro bono for free, defending the Mojave Desert Veterans Memorial. A lone white Latin cross that was erected over 70 years ago to honor the men and women who gave their lives in World War I. The ACLU filed a lawsuit seeking to tear it down. The federal district court ordered that veterans memorial torn to the ground. It went up on appeal. The federal court of appeals said you have to take the veterans memorial down. They actually ordered that the cross be covered with a giant sack with a chain and a padlock at the bottom. Well, I'll say this. The court was right in one regard. The image of the cross has power. 
We went to the U.S. Supreme Court on behalf of over 3 million veterans, and we won 5-4 upholding that memorial. And these threats have only accelerated. You know, a little over a month ago, I was proud to host a religious liberty rally in Iowa. We had over 2,500 people come out in defense of religious liberty. It was the single largest political event in Iowa this year. You know, the media diminish threats to religious liberty. They say it's not real. They say it's made, made up. Don't worry about it. We brought in nine heroes to simply tell their stories. To tell their stories directly from the stage. You know, typically at a political event, the candidate's front and center. I very deliberately wanted to recede and to have each of those nine heroes tell their stories. There's a reason Jesus spoke in parables. It's what moves hearts. It's what connects with who we are as people. There were people like Dick and Betty Odegaard, a couple I've gotten to know very well. Dick and Betty live in Grimes, Iowa. They own an historic Lutheran church. They started a business hosting weddings. At wonderful weddings, and they did the catering, they did the flowers. And then a couple of years ago, two men came in, and they wanted to get married in the Odegaards church. Now, the Odegaards are devout Mennonites, so they very politely, they very respectfully said, listen, we cannot celebrate and host your wedding. It is contrary to our faith. The next day, Dick and Betty were sued. They spent 18 months in litigation. They paid over $5,000 to settle the suit, and they promised never again to host another wedding. In August, Dick and Betty went bankrupt. They laid off all their employees. This month, they are auctioning off all of the property in the church. Another person who talked at the rally was Kelvin Cochran. An African-American grew up in an inner city, a difficult home. His whole life he wanted to be a fireman. And he achieved his dream. He became a fireman. He rose to become the chief of the fire department in Atlanta. He then went to Washington. President Obama appointed him to a national fire board. He moved to Washington, served in the Obama administration. Then he came back to Atlanta and resumed his role as chief of the fire department there. Well, Chief Cochran was also a Sunday school teacher. And in teaching Sunday school, he began teaching about the book of Genesis. And in particular, he started focusing on the passage where God asks Adam and Eve, who told you you were naked? And he began thinking about what the word naked means, not simply without clothes, but without the covering of God's love, of God's redemption. And he contrasted it to all the places in the scripture where it talks about being clothed in righteousness, clothed in Jesus' redeeming blood. And ended up writing a book based on his Sunday school teachings called Who Told You You Were Naked? And in that book, about a page and a half of that book, discusses human sexuality and what scripture says about that. Chief Cochran was fired for his job for writing that book. In his private time as a Sunday school teacher, for writing a book about what the Bible teaches, he was told you cannot be the fire chief of the city of Atlanta anymore. I got to tell you, the entire event, it was three hours, 2,500 people, nobody left. It was, I would encourage you, we have the whole thing online at tedcruz.org, I would encourage you to go watch it. It will lift your spirits to hear these stories, because these are ordinary people. A fireman a florist, a baker, a t-shirt maker, ordinary people whose faith, faith was tested, who stood up and stood with God. I believe 2016 is going to be a religious liberty election. And for anyone who thinks, well, these are distant threats, these don't impact me. At the Supreme Court's gay marriage oral argument last year, Justice Alito asked the Obama Justice Department, if your position prevails, will the next step be for the Obama IRS to go after Christian universities? 
that follow a biblical teaching of marriage. And by extension, Christian grade schools like the school here at Prestonwood or charities. The answer from the Obama Justice Department is yes. That is a very real possibility, the IRS targeting those who follow a biblical teaching of marriage. That is wrong. It is not who we are. But let me give you a word of encouragement. As these threats grow darker and darker and darker, they are waking people up here in Texas and all across this country. I believe 2016 will be an election like 1980. And it took Jimmy Carter to give us Ronald Reagan. So I can't wait to see where we're headed next. Thank you. My goodness, you know how to fire people up. You could be a preacher, I think, or something close. Well, Dr. Graham, you can understand it's even worse. I'm a PK. <laughs> a preacher's kid. I know that. And uh, well, my goodness, uh, you and I sat down with uh, your beautiful wife, Heidi, uh, back in June. And a lot has happened in the last five months. And uh, you, you talked about your vision and your dream and what God had put in your heart. And uh, we're already seeing so much of that happen. And uh, the Lord seems to be elevating you and giving you favor with people. And you're certainly here in Texas. You're back home. And uh, we're really glad that you are. Okay, back on the religious freedom uh, mm -hmm. issue. One of our concerns, obviously, is judicial activism. Yeah. And I know this is something that uh, you've talked about, you're concerned about as well. Uh, judges who seem to be making law rather than interpreting yeah. Yeah. law. How do, how do you view this? And, and how can we, if you are president, what kind of judges would you appoint? Right. In particular, Supreme Court justices. We know elections matter, as we talked about earlier, and this is one of the big ways that elections matter. But do we have a problem with judicial activism in this country? It, it is an enormous problem, and it is growing. Uh, if you look at in June, in the course of 24 hours, we had two decisions that were both utterly lawless. First, the Supreme Court, a handful of unelected judges, rewrote the text of Obamacare, ignored the federal statute to force that failed law on millions of Americans. 24 hours later, five unelected judges purported to tear down the marriage laws of all 50 states. Both of those decisions were lawless. They were judicial activism. There's not a word in the Constitution that supports them. And you know, Dr. Graham, this is an issue that really separates a number of the candidates running on the Republican side in 2016. Several of the Republican candidates, when the marriage decision came out, put out statements that effectively said, it's settled, it's the law of the land, we need to accept it, surrender, and move on. Those are word for word the talking points of President Obama. I can tell you, I for one do not accept it, I'm not willing to surrender, and I'm not willing to give up on the Constitution. Mm. And you know, Dr. Graham, you asked about judicial appointments. If you look at the court, almost every Democratic appointee on every big picture case, big issue case, votes 100% the way the liberals want them to. Republicans, we bat about 500. Many of the most egregious judicial activists, Earl Warren, William Brennan, John Paul Stevens, David Souter, Harry Blackman, who authored Roe versus Wade, every one of those were Republican appointees. And the problem, we run into the same problem over and over again. You know, at the last debate, I talked about two moments in time. 
Number one, in 1990, when George Herbert Walker Bush had in one room David Souter, and in another room Edith Jones, the rock ribbed conservative on the Fifth Circuit Federal Court of Appeals. And Bush 41 went with Souter. And then in 2005, George W. Bush had a similar choice, had John Roberts in one room, and had my former boss, Mike Ludig, the rock ribbed conservative on the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, in the other room, and George W. Bush went with Roberts. Now, in both instances, it wasn't that the President Bushes wanted to put a liberal on the court. They didn't want that. But with Edith Jones and Mike Ludig, they had spent over a decade each on the court being a principled jurist following the Constitution. If you nominated them, you would have a fight. If you nominated them, Democrats would go nuts because they'd understand Mike Ludig was Antonin Scalia's first law clerks. They know exactly what they're going to get. And with David Souter and John Roberts, the advantage was they had said very little, they had no paper trail, and every single time we've gone with a judicial nominee who doesn't have a paper trail, it's turned into an utter disaster. So in the Republican field, in the Republican field, every one of the candidates will sit down with you and tell you, I will appoint strict constructionist who will follow the Constitution and not legislate from the bench. Those are the talking points. Every candidate says it. The difference is who's willing to actually spend the capital and fight to do what they said. I have spent my entire adult life fighting judicial activism. There are few, if any, choices. You know, one of the things that so many people are upset about is sending people to Washington who don't get things done, yeah. who say one thing and end up doing nothing. And one of the things that we have appreciated about you is your willingness to go and stand on your principles. And even when you are criticized for it, you have been uncompromising. <laughs> So when people talk about being an outsider and at the same time you are a senator and a very good one, how, how, do you, how does that work for you uh, in that you, you've been going up against, uh, sometimes I'm sure it's like hitting your head against a rock, but how, how have you been able to manage this? And, and as president, how can you affect change in this way? Yes. So, so it, it is a great question. Um, you know, I'm very encouraged by what we're seeing. Um, if you look at, at the Republican presidential primary, I think one of the most tremendously helpful things to my campaign has been Donald Trump's candidacy. <laughs> For one thing, it certainly made it interesting. <laughs> but, you know, Donald has really framed the central issue in this primary as who will stand up to Washington. Now, if that's the central issue, the natural next question is, okay, who actually has stood up to Washington? <laughs> and I can't think of a better question to decide this race because in that regard, my record is markedly different from that of anyone else on that stage. <laughs> you know, a couple of examples. In 2013, when, when millions of Americans rose up against the disaster that is Obamacare, I was proud to lead that fight. You look to the other 10 Republicans standing on that debate stage, and the, the question naturally arises, where were they? You look to 2014, when millions of Americans rose up against President Obama's illegal executive amnesty. Once again, I was proud to lead that fight. And once again, you look to the other very fine men and women on that stage, and you ask, where were they? And, and here, you don't have to go back to 2013 or 2014. You can go back to a couple of weeks ago. You know, Dr. Graham, you remember that debate in California where just about every Republican looked in the TV camera and said, we should defund Planned Parenthood. Well, it's easy to say that. Just two weeks ago, we had a knockdown, drag out fight in Washington. Millions of Americans rose up against Planned Parenthood. Pastors all over the country lit up the phones. I was proud to lead the fight against Planned Parenthood. You look to the other folks. 
you know, to everyone who spoke so passionately at the debate, my natural question is, where were they? Can you imagine how different it would have been if 11 Republican presidential candidates descended on Washington and spoke in unison and said, Mitch McConnell and John Boehner don't send $500 million of taxpayer money to Planned Parenthood? Amen. Courage. We like that. We like courage. Um, okay, in the last presidential election, um, many evangelical Christians did yes. not vote. Yes. Uh, I've, I've heard all kinds of numbers, maybe up to 8 million, for whatever reason, set out, uh, not inspired, maybe a little bit of Washington fatigue, polit political fatigue, whatever. Uh, I do sense that people are fired up now yes. and uh, that we're ready to do a lot better. And while some want to suggest that evangelical Christians are splintering and that we're really not that committed and so on, uh, what, what do you say about that? Uh, and, and do you believe Christians, uh, members of churches, uh, should engage in the political process? Uh, talk to us a little bit about citizenship yeah. and our responsibility as you view it to, to get to the polls, to get involved in the process. Well, Dr. Graham, I think it is absolutely vital. I think the entire election turns on that question. Uh, you know, many of the folks here know my father, Pastor Rafael Cruz. For those who do, you know that I am the shy, soft-spoken one in the family. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> but, you know, as you know, my father has, has a real calling to other pastors. And, and several years ago, God really put a burden on his heart, that, that, that no one bears greater responsibility for where this country is today than the pastors. And, and it's, it's a hard message. It's not an easy message to hear or to deliver, but he travels and speaks at pastors' conferences all over the country. And the, and the message my dad says, he says, you know, if the flock stumbles into a ditch, you don't blame the sheep. You blame the shepherd. And there are too many pastors, unfortunately as my father says, who hide behind the pulpit, who don't do what you're doing now, which is standing up and encouraging the body of Christ, we have a responsibility. You know, the census data show there are about 90 million evangelicals and evangelical Christians in America. In the 2012 election, 54 million evangelicals didn't vote. It's a majority of evangelical Christians. If believers are staying home, if we are allowing our leaders to be elected by non-believers, is it any wonder we have a federal government that is assaulting life and marriage and religious liberty? Mm -hmm. sure. Okay, let, let's bring back health care. The Affordable Care Act was supposed to make health care more accessible at a lower cost. How's that working out? <laughs> And how do you propose to fix it? Let me start. It is a disaster. It is a train wreck. And we should repeal every word of it. And, you know, for that to happen, Washington doesn't want to do that. You know, I. I wrote a book a couple of months ago called A Time for Truth, where, where I talked about what I call the Washington cartel, career politicians in both parties who get in bed with lobbyists and special interest and grow and grow, grow government. Washington does not want to repeal Obamacare. The only way to do it is to make this election a referendum on repealing Obamacare. Mm. And, and let me point to an analogy. 
You know, if you think of the 1980 election, I often invoke the 1980 election. I think we are reliving history in powerful ways. Can you imagine Ronald Reagan, if he had come in to this church in 1979 and if he had said, Dr. Graham, we're going to cut the top marginal tax rate from 70 percent to 28 percent. We're going to go from stagnant economic growth to booming growth, millions lifted into prosperity. Our hostages will be released from Iran the day I am sworn into office. And within 10 years, we'll win the Cold War and tear the Berlin Wall to the ground. We would have all dismissed him as a nutcase. <laughs> because under no reasonable assessment of Washington was that possible. What Reagan did in 1980 is he made it a referendum. The Reagan revolution changed the incentives in Washington. He cut that tax rate from 70 to 28 percent, and he did it with Tip O'Neill, a Democrat, as Speaker of the House. And the reason is simple. There's an old joke that politics is Hollywood for ugly people. <laughs> Which my wife Heidi tells me I resemble that remark. <laughs> but, but, but the way you get things done, the way you repeal Obamacare and pass common sense health care reform is you change the incentives so that if you come out of November 2016 with a mandate from the people, that's what causes Republicans and Democrats to say, I ain't standing in the way of that, and that's how we turn it around. Well, I'm so tempted to do my Reagan impersonation oh, right there. Please, please do. Okay. There you go again. Uh. <laughs> you know, Ronald Reagan came um, to this city uh, and I guess it was 1979, and he said to a group of evangelicals, James Robinson was there, a part of uh, gathering that group. He said, look, I know you can't endorse me, but I can endorse you. Amen. And uh, we're so thankful for your endorsement of values that you hold yes. uh, yourself and of the values that we share. Um, so one final question is, how does your faith, your personal faith, strengthen your life? Where do you get this courage and this fire and this passion that you have? Well, look, I mean, my faith is, is an integral part uh, of who I am. You know, it, often on the trail, I'll share my testimony. And, you know, for me, my testimony begins actually when I was a very young child with my parents. Uh, for those of y'all that, that know my dad now, you didn't know him when he was a young man. Uh, when I was two and three years old, my parents, neither one of them were Christians. They were living up in Calgary, and both of them drank far too much. And when I was three, my dad left us. He decided he didn't want to be married anymore. He didn't want to be a father to a three-year-old son. And he got on a plane, and he flew down to Houston. And he was there a couple of months, and, and a colleague from the oil and gas business invited my dad to a Bible study. And it was at the home of a local life insurance agent. And for whatever reason, my father went. And, and he described being struck by the peace he saw at that Bible study. Remember, there was one woman who, who, who talked about that her son would beat her to get money for drugs. And yet she had what Scripture calls the peace that passes understanding. And my father couldn't understand it. It didn't make sense to him, but he knew he didn't have it, and he knew he wanted it. And that night at the end of the Bible study, they said, well, I'll tell you what, our pastor's coming tomorrow night because he had a lot of questions. Why don't you come tomorrow night, and you can talk with our pastor? So he came back the next night. He stayed three, four, five hours till late in the night arguing. My father was convinced he was an atheist. He was convinced he knew this God stuff was all hooey, and he could disprove. And he went through question after question after question. And at the end of the night, he said, all right, what about the man in Tibet who's never heard of Jesus? And the pastor very wisely didn't take the bait. And he said, Raphael, I don't know about the man in Tibet, but you've heard of Jesus. What's your excuse? Mm 
that hit my dad like a ton of bricks, and, and he fell to his knees. He gave his life to Jesus. He went, got in the car, drove to the airport, bought a plane ticket, and flew back to Calgary to be with my mother and me. So when people ask about the role of faith, I can tell you in my life, if it were not for the redemptive love of Jesus Christ, I, I would have been raised by a single mom without my dad in the house. And, and I'll tell you just a, a, an incredible epilogue. So I, I became a Christian when I was eight at that same church, Clay Road Baptist Church. Galen Wiley, who's the pastor who led my dad to the Lord, baptized me. And a couple of months ago on the campaign trail, I was in Tennessee. And it so happened that, that Galen Wiley had re has retired to Tennessee. And he came out to the rally, and, and I had not seen him in, in 35 years. I was 10 years old when I last saw him. And I have to tell you, it was a powerful, I, I choked up to have the opportunity, opportunity just to hug Brother Wiley and say thank you. If you hadn't shared the gospel with my dad, my entire life and my family's life would have been different. Amen. Amen. What a story. It's the power of God. And so now we know the rest of the story and how your character has been formed. How can we pray for you and your family going forward? You know, I'd say three things. Peace and wisdom. But then also, especially if you would pray for our girls. You know, our girls, Caroline and Catherine, they're here somewhere. They're, they're right here. over here. There's Heidi. Stand up, Heidi. The girls. <laughs> Heidi Cruz. Caroline Cruz, stand up. Stand up, my love. <laughs> <laughs> so they're seven and four they are the joys of our life but I will tell you the hardest part of this campaign is, is being on the road being you know this, this week I, I've been in D.C., Iowa, Houston California, New Hampshire here I'm headed to Austin, San Antonio and back to D.C. so the girls drove up to be with us for a couple of hours and it, two girls that are seven and four it is hard on them, and so that, I, uh, the prayers that they know they are loved yeah. with all of our heart and loved by God as well. How would you like to tell Heidi and those girls we love them and pray for them? Yeah. Senator Cruz, thank you for your service. Thank you for your sacrifice. You're standing before you. God bless you.